Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about a symposium. <laughs> well, sort of. It's an unusual format today. There's a bunch of on-location recording from a conference that I attended last week, as of this recording, um, which I'll set up a bit in a moment. But Mark, would you like to explain why we're calling this a symposium? Yes. Well, I mean, as you no doubt know, symposium is another word basically for conference. Mm -hmm. Specifically, symposium comes from Greek symposion, and it was a type, originally, a type of drinking party. Mm-hmm. So give us the etymology of the word, and then I'll uh, explain. Okay. Well, symposion uh, is made up of two elements, sin, meaning together, mm -hmm. and posis, meaning drinking. And you linked that with? A number of other words. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root, po or poi, which means to drink. And it also comes into Latin as potare, to right. drink, right? Um, as well as Latin bibera, mm -hmm. to drink. So they both come from that root. And so we get a number of English derivatives from those two Latin words. Mm -hmm. From Bibero, we get words like um, imbibe, mm -hmm. for instance. From um, potara, we get potable mm -hmm. and stuff like that. There are also some more surprising developments from those Latin, those two Latin uh, roots. Mm -hmm. One of which is beer, probably. <laughs> so the, the, the idea is that Bibera gets borrowed into a, into Germanic languages in reference to a, a thing you drink. Right. It produced the name beer. Right. So that the word for beer, which was so despised in general by early Romans anyway, though mm -hmm. we'll get to that in a moment, is actually nonetheless a Latin word. It is a Latin word. But that goes back to the same root that gives us symposium. And that is relevant to this episode because the heart of this episode is an event that took place at the conference or symposium that I was mm -hmm. attending, uh, which was a tasting of ancient beer. In fact, ironically, Rowan beer, a beer brewed according to a Roman recipe. Mm -hmm. Some other uh, words that we get from uh, Latin uh, potare mm -hmm. um, are potable and poison. Ah, the poison being the surprising one. The surprising one. one. Though, you know, I guess we still do, uh, you know, go into a bar and the bartender asks, <laughs> what's your what's poison? poison? <laughs> um, and potion as well also comes right, from that, right. uh, that root. But there are even more surprising words that come from the Proto-Indo-European root through different lines. Mm -hmm. One of which is pierogi. <laughs> So that comes through Old Church Slavonic, mm -hmm. a word piru, which means feast, actually. All right. So food, not drink. Food. So it, it, it gets changed. shifts and, over yeah. to food, to a food-related thing. Um, and piru becomes eventually uh, pierogi in uh, Polish and, and various related, related um, Slavic languages have, right. have a version of that. And one more uh, kind of surprising one uh, is hibachi. <laughs> the small barbecue the small japanese barbecue okay now you may be thinking oh wait a minute japanese is not descended from proto-indo-european Proto -Indo -European. i am i am indeed mark thinking <laughs> now wait a minute <laughs> so the idea goes that uh so the the he part means fire and that presumably is a japanese word okay uh, word, word element word element the second part Bachi in Japanese means bowl or pot. Now, one etymologist anyways, Calvert Watkins, who I trust quite a lot, mm -hmm. derives this bachi word ultimately from a Sanskrit word. So it would be borrowed from ah, Sanskrit, which is, which a, is a possible, yeah, and which is a possible connection because possible. Sanskrit certainly did move to the east. Yes. Yeah. So there is a Sanskrit word patram, which means cup or bowl. Okay. So hibachi is sort of a fire, a fire bowl. bowl. Yeah. yeah, which is what it is. Mm -hmm. And the bowl word comes from the action of drinking, to drink. Right. In Proto -Indo -European. right. So next time you go to a symposium, <laughs> make sure you drink beer, eat pierogi, pierogies, and cook other foods on a hibachi. But don't cook, cook the pierogies, pierogies on, on the hibachi. hibachi. No, that that will work. not be good. No, no. <laughs> well, thank you. There we go. There's your etymologies for this episode because there really aren't any in the rest of it. No. 
and I basically take my leave. <laughs> All right. Yes, because what I'm going to do is uh, pretty much get right into it. Essentially, what I have is a couple of very short interviews with people from the conference. I thought what might be fun would be to give a little bit of an ongoing report from what it's like to be at an academic conference and what sort of things we did. And then, as I said, the main bulk of it is uh, tasting and discussion of these ancient drinks. We called it an ancient drink cocktail hour, mm -hmm. uh, which took place in my hotel room, which had a little living room suite thing. So it wasn't quite as odd <laughs> as just inviting all of my colleagues to my room for drinks. <laughs> and uh, I am not gonna, don't need to do much to set it up because I talk about it and, and there's a lot of explanation in the course of it. Now, because I took my microphone on location and interviewed people, there's a bit of a range of sound. And in particular, the main part, there's a lot of people in the room. And so there's a bit of you know, crosstalk and people talking over, but I think I've edited it so it's pretty clear. Apologies if you find the sound a little bit off. It isn't, of course, exactly like our ever so fancy home studio setup. So we'll we'll find out what the ancient attitudes towards beer are. Uh, no. What we'll find out <laughs> is what the modern attitudes are towards ancient Should beer. Be. <laughs> <laughs> But we do talk about um, the making of it. Yeah, we don't talk a lot in in the discussion about how the Romans, why the Romans were drinking beer, or where this recipe comes from. To be honest, mm -hmm. that wasn't a big part of it. We did talk about that, of course, back in our own beer episode, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe we'll talk about it more in, in the future. So, without further ado, I'll get to the first bit, which is me setting up where I was and what was going on, and then I'll introduce the rest after that. So, hi. I am your roving reporter, reporting from the CAC, Classical Association of Canada, annual general meeting in Calgary, Alberta. We're at the end of day one of the CAC. I had two panels this morning. The first was on public-facing scholarship. The second was on pedagogy, bringing the modern student into the ancient world, or vice versa. I don't know. It was the Graduate Student Caucus... Um, panel and it was great. It's been a long day and I'm getting a little blurry, but right now I'm in my hotel room ready to set up for Drink Ancient Cocktail Hour, where we're going to try some ancient versions of beer and mead. I've made some barley water by boiling barley on the stove, draining the liquid and taking the liquid and mixing it with honey and fresh mint. And another colleague, Kevin Soles, is going to bring some wine and cheese, and I have some ground barley, and we're going to try to make kukeon, which is a drink mentioned in Homer, wine with barley and cheese in it, which sounds horrifying. The beer is a collaboration by Matt Gibbs and a brewery in Manitoba in Winnipeg, and uh, Matt found a recipe for an ancient beer, and the brewery made it, and also a mead, and then a beer that's made in a, a comparison style. I'm going to try to get him to tell us more about that soon. So we've got a bottle of a growler of each of those and ready to taste. So I'm hoping some of our colleagues will drop by this rather informal and last minute event and try some ancient drinks. This morning's panels, by the way, were so much about the online world that I mentioned this podcast in both of them. And if anyone has come and is listening to this podcast because of the panel, hi, welcome. I hope you find it interesting. Feel free to leave us a comment and let us know how you found the conference. Before the main event got started, though, I had time for a quick chat with Vicki Austin Perry. So here's that discussion. So this is Vicki Austin Perry, who was live tweeting the panels today and did an amazing <laughs> job of it. So Vicki, tell us who you are, what you're doing, and how your day was. Okay, so um, my name's Vicki, um, and I'm a PhD student at King's College London, but um, a bit randomly, I live in Canada whilst I'm doing that. Um, so I kind of have one foot in the door in Canadian classics and one foot in the door in UK classics. Um, I also run the Twitter account for the Graduate Student Caucus of um, the Classical Association of Canada. So today I was tweeting from a mixture of my own personal account and the GSC account. And I think it was a really successful first day. So I really enjoyed the panels and... Yeah. <laughs> did you find it a little complicated to go back and forth and tweet that much? Um, You've done some live tweeting before. Yeah, I did some live tweeting 
last year at the conference, but only I only at that stage had my own personal account. Mm. So this year, um, I was going between two accounts. I did have one mishap of saying, <laughs> oh, I'm back on my personal account, but I tweeted that from the GSC account. So, <laughs> But I think overall, I successfully um, tweeted the right things from the right account today. <laughs> Great. And yeah, you were the two of the panels I was at and then two other ones and you enjoyed everything you saw? Yeah, I really enjoyed um, all the panels today, especially the pedagogical ones, um, particularly because um, I'm in approaching the final year of my PhD. So I'm really starting to think about, oh, how am I going to teach when I'm going to get a job? So I picked up loads of tips and tricks, I guess, and really interesting hearing different perspectives, especially the latin through science and the terminology ones yeah, yeah um, the, the latin through science was mind-blowing and i yeah. haven't like tweeted about it or anything because i have to think about it and then yeah. like talk about it more it was Be- amazing because that was really kind of new information for me mm. it was interesting because leslie one of the speakers said that this this was a really common type of course in canada oh for the, um, the for, terminology for course, terminology yeah. whereas in coming from a uk background i'd never heard of that type of course mm. before so i I was really interested in to learn um, about how those courses operate and what they involve um, so that was all brand new information for me great well so we're just waiting to get started on our drink ancient <laughs> evening um, so maybe we'll go set that up but thank you very much Vicky thank you <laughs> And then the rest of the guests appeared, and as we got started, Kevin Solez of McEwen University talked about the Homeric drink Kukion and explained what his plan was for the evening. Then Matt Gibbs from the University of Winnipeg introduced his ancient style beers and his mead. Now, there are a number of other people whose voices I'm not going to try to explain who's who, and I, they, don't get, they don't introduce themselves, but just so you know who's in the room. The other people who were there for the part that was recorded were Amber Porter, Mary Dominion, Caroline Willikers, Connor Waitley, Peter Miller, and Vicky Austin Perry, whom we've already heard from. So again, apologies if the sound is a little unclear sometimes, but I hope you can understand the majority of it. So when you work on uh, food in like Homer, for instance, uh, for example, a lot of it is appealing. Like you can understand why roasted meat you know, on skewer, on spits or whatever. So, yeah, it sounds good. Imagine enjoying it. <laughs> right? And then yeah. other things are like nut cakes and cheese, um, <clears throat> fruits, bread. bread, all that sounds good. And then they make this drink, which sounds absolutely disgusting. You know, they take pramnian wine. I mean, I'm assuming it's a red. <laughs> they, they grate goat's cheese into it. They sprinkle barley groats in it. And they serve it with honey, sounds good, mm-hmm. and onion. <laughs> anyway, so since I generally believe that they were eating things good for the palate, you know, mm-hmm. I've always wanted to try to figure out how to make something out of those ingredients that, just, <laughs> not, that would actually taste good. First of all, the idea of putting cheese and wine sounds gross to me. I mean, I can eat them like yeah. separately, but, <laughs> but just putting it right in sounds gross. <laughs> And then serving it with onion roasted or not, I don't know. <laughs> you uh, really but you know, I, I had a friend from Malaysia who said that the onions in Malaysia are so sweet that you can eat them like apples. So I just wonder if there's some kind of onion that would Maybe. actually be sweet and not like burn mm. your mouth or something like that. Anyway, so what I want to do with the red wine is uh, grate some cheese into it. So what kind of, what and, kind of cheese are Well, you? these are Greek cheeses okay. and they're hard goat cheese. So, yeah. <laughs> so I've got, I've got a, a you know, hard uh, feta, a halloumi. I just grabbed it. It's mm-hmm. halloumi. Sorry, that's... Um, oh, Parmesan, just in case these cheeses don't grate. I'm like, well, maybe it'll just be good with grated Parmesan. I like that stuff. It's still vaguely so, much true. Yeah. Anyway, and so, this is toasted barley, toasted barley. and ground so, somewhat. So, so that's right. your barley. So also put in the wine. Yeah. So also put in yeah. the wine. Yeah. Right. It's a meal in okay. the cup. Now, I was say, this is getting like, I, like uh, it can't, it can't be worse than alcoholic it. horse milk. Anyway, anyway, I brought the Retsina uh, just because they found uh, in ar- archaeological digs that some of those. Uh, pots where they can detect wine, mm-hmm. they can also detect pine resin. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like they they were doing retzina a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And so I could just crack the retzina and people can have some retzina. And then I I'll worry about <clears throat> mashing up the... And nobody needs to, but uh, I'm oh, not... My word. <laughs> this is barley water. So this is barley boiled in water. Oh, and then you drain the barley out and, and keep the water. <laughs> 
and I added a bit of honey and fresh mint. And it's actually, it's it's basically very plain. It doesn't, you know, it's just pretty much tastes a bit like mint. It's nothing. It's also non-alcoholic, so if anyone doesn't want to, because Matt's going to say that this stuff is pretty strong. That's actually really good. Yeah, it's oh, like that. I'll try it. It's like rehydrate. It's very yeah, refreshing. Mm-hmm. I yeah, I think so it should be the next big health bite. It's probably full fiber and salad. I'm not sure. Here you are. Even some some sweet Greek name. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so it's just like it's fresh mint, honey, and. Water from boiling barley, like it's nothing mm-hmm. horrifying. Mm-hmm. Y'all trying some? <laughs> no, this is actually nice. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, this is amazing. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like a digestive source. I'm gonna have to. Have yeah. that. Mm-hmm. I know. Like a digestive of some yeah. sort, you know, just to sort of Let's do it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, it's cheers. Very good. Oh, cheers. 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 Thanks cheers. for doing it. Well, Matt, do you want to tell us about your beer? Okay, so introduction. It's this is a fourth century. Beer from Thermopolis, mm. or at least the recipe is. It's awful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not. I don't want it. If you drink this, you're taking your any of this. <laughs> you're taking your life into your own hands. Um, I'm intrigued. Yeah. I yeah, you're selling it pretty high. So this is how it all started. So it started when I was in the bar. <laughs> Someone said, "Is there any ancient beer recipes?" And we found one. That, like that, honestly, it's the most simple research project ever. <laughs> anyway, it's. Um, I will warn you, it is a very different taste. Uh, it's very low alcohol. This one is is really is. It's about, probably around three percent. We don't know for sure. It's unless you have twelve anywhere between twelve and twelve hundred dollars, two thousand dollars worth of equipment, you can't measure alcohol because anything that you the, the flotation devices are problematic, especially mm-hmm. in stuff like this. This one, as I said, this one's around 3%. It, it's not agonizing. It won't kill you. Um, <laughs> the wine one will. Oh, okay. All right. This is an applied taste. So, and this, just ingredients-wise, it's barley and, and water. And water, yeah. Okay. Uh, so and a sourdough culture, because, of course, they didn't have any. And, yeast. Yeah, and the problem was, is that in the middle of... We wanted to do it authentically, but it was minus 40. <laughs> in Winnipeg. And, uh, an issue in Greece, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it, that was problematic in itself. Um, you mean just existential? <laughs> There's always a problem. <laughs> Anyone? It's continued. To, I, I will say this: it's continued to ferment in. The, it's actually continued to ferment in the bowl. <laughs> See, I, I may, I may have, I, I often told that I had to sell this, but it's, um, no, I don't think I do. At least for me, it's. I was different. I can yeah. detect sourdough. Oh yeah, no, it, there's a distinct yeah. It's a pickly element to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's something cidery. Yeah, no cidery. Yes, there oh, is. Like I'll it. give it another go. Yeah, right. <laughs> you'll notice that it tastes I mean, almost the same. No, it's it's nothing like what we're waiting? expecting it to be as beer, but it's oh, not no. on the face of it like yeah. massively yeah. unpleasant. No, it's not like <laughs> and I mean, from what you were saying, we were going for massively unpleasant here. No, no, no. no. There I mean, are beers that are far worse. There definitely are. Oh yeah. But it's not what you're sort of expecting. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's weirdly refreshing. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Melissa has a really good idea. Melissa has a really good idea. Maybe you kind of get used to like the to add acidic sparkling yeah. water. Yeah. Yeah. Make it almost like, yeah. 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 And the garlic water. Yeah. Yeah. They taste rustic. Yeah. So it's a change to cheese. Yeah. 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 It's busier too. Yeah. yeah. It is. So it's, yeah. it's much yeah. It's more yeah. 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 So it needs to be like two this. months old to be good. It really is. <laughs> it must be aged for. <laughs> it's not bad. No, it's not. No, 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 no. The first sip is kind of like, oh. Yeah. 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 It's very bright. It's like Yeah. It's not heavy. The more you drink, the more you get the aftertaste. And that's what we're going to do. I went back to the Bar Hammer's actual beers. Yeah, it's a little different. I got this at Sui. You heavily involved in the taste. Wow. Testing of movies. <laughs> but we had an alumni night, which oh, was yeah. our, our use of it, and um, the alumni office was kind enough to give us money, which went towards mm-hmm. renting out a bar with an open bar. Mm-hmm. And then also having drink. little bits of And this. then this available too. So <laughs> it was a lot of pizza. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the mead was debuted at my house. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, so, we, so Connor was the test subject. We mm-hmm. basically fed Connor about 10 ounces of it. <laughs> his face went red and he could stand up. Uh, <laughs> which, which, which means it was good. Yeah. Okay, so tell us so about it. tell us about the mead then. No, well, the mead is con- is straight from Colorado. It's yes, basically um, honey and which we saw from uh, like fields in Manitoba. 
Yeah, we've, well, we we had to use a red wine grape must, which is available in any pack, or, you know, any mm -hmm. any wine making kit. The problem was that we couldn't source grapes. We, so we have the wine mead, and then we did a, like a medieval comparable, which mm. is basically ale with honey. <laughs> <laughs> The reason why the blue mice were at the we do this with this very interesting piece of interest in the history of beer generally. So he he has this. It has bits of bee anus in it, I think. <laughs> bits of bee and wax and awfulness. Um, the other one seems to have come out. So uh, apparently the mead is very strong, though. So we should all know this yeah, if you're going to have it. Oh, yeah, the mead is No one has to leave for any time soon, though, so you're all good. <laughs> if you can't stand up, you'll be fine. <laughs> this is probably around. It's upwards of 70, at least 70%. So is that the mead? This is the mead, yeah. Mm. It's probably around, we think it's over 20. Some of us think it's over 20, but... Thank you. I'm sorry, yeah, everyone's just getting handed. This is, this is drink, drink. And by the time we've had all of these, and then we try the, the wine with the cheese, mm -hmm. yeah. they'll be like, that's even <laughs> great! <laughs> that's just drink <laughs> You sure you're right? Oh, that is... Oh. It does take a time. It does, I think it does dissipate, but it takes a long time. But this is really yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, it's very Bar sweet still. It's surprising. Barnhammer, the, the brewery that we do this with, have offered to because of the interest in all this. There are two things. Firstly, we talked about doing another one in September, doing a, a, like another a, event, yeah. and uh, well, actually, just doing a another cask, and they'll mm -hmm. sell it, and they'll give us they'll give the department the proceeds. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. Nice. The other thing is, is that they're talking about marketing that. Mm. It's, it's marketable. Yeah, it is. Like, yeah. It is eminently marketable. People will buy that. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Because I've never seen a mead with a red before. It's always been sort of that lighter, almost honey color. It's yeah, no, it's Italian grapes. That's all that's all Cornwell says. Anything, does he see red? He might see red. I don't remember why he chose red. There must be, he must be, maybe, yeah. we'll double check it. No, it's fantastic. Yeah, I've never seen a red mead Yeah, well, before. because most mead that I know of is just honey. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that's, you know, that's one yeah. style is just honey. So then you're going to have a honey mead wine, I guess. Yeah. But this is a meat, uh, you know, yeah. honey wine blend, and it's really nice, uh, though. Mm -hmm. It's definitely but strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, this is exactly what he said it was. Why don't you do the wine? Why okay, don't you do the yeah. So, uh, okay, so uh, Nestor and Macaon in Book 11 of the Iliad uh, sit down to what is supposed to be like a restorative uh, feast. Uh, I mean, it's a re 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 they're recovering. They're recovering. And Nestor has his servant woman <laughs> prepare for them a kukeon. So it's a kukeon feast, you know? So it, it, it's a primary wine, grated cheese. And the other archaeological detail about the grated cheese is that in, like, feasting equipment that gets deposited in graves, like cups and plates and, and craters, there are graters. There are, there are graters. So, so you know, in the Iron Age and into the Archaic period, there are graters. So, I mean, this is not just a heroic uh, idealization of something, but people are really yes. grading stuff. Yeah, um, it's like it's like you're a hero, eh? And so you have like weapons and some spits to roast meat, and you got your cheese. In a war, I'm immortal. So, right. So she puts the she she puts the cheese in there, and then she sprinkles it with barley. And there's honey, so I'm going to put some honey in too. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to put some cheese in. I went with halloumi because it was dry and grateable, and it's and Greek and it's goat cheese with the goat Ooh, cheese. But, so it also doesn't have a really strong flavor. I don't know how much to put in. <laughs> Lots. <laughs> so I. That's you know we'll, the, we'll start the, there. We'll see how it goes. Maybe I'll do two of them. The heroic cheese front. I suppose they they <laughs> want to figure out why Dutch people are so damn tall. Right. And um, they've actually determined that it's because they consume more cheese than anybody else. But there's some correlation between wow. how tall you get Jeez. and how much cheese you eat. So maybe that explains how giant A little honey. Mm -hmm. Just a dabble. More than a dabble. <laughs> Once you've stirred know, this I'm up, this is what we can to... serve in the little tiny yeah, shot yeah, glasses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is she supposed You're to ready. dissolve some kind of words? I, you know, <laughs> don't you wish it would? Don't you wish it would? Meal in a cup. Meal in a cup. Meal in a cup. Meal in a cup. When has Homer <laughs> ever let us astray? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, living your entire life as Homer tells you, I can't see any flaws no, in that. No, no, no. A year of living Homerically would not go well for you. <laughs> so it would be such a good one. All right, so let's sprinkle it. Project. Yeah. Kevin, you have a book project that you're living in America. Living in America. It's a lot of options to eat. Let me sprinkle the white bar. It's it's front you it's a mix it's a mixed drink. It's like you can imagine it being muddled. Yeah. 
I, I guess some right. people suggest that the idea is it's hospitable because it's filling and nutritious. Yeah, it's right. more than just wine. It's yeah. got food so in it. It's a fortifying it kind of yeah. Yeah. cheese in the wine. Yeah. High nutrition, mm-hmm. you know, high well, calories or high herbs, herbs in, a, high, <laughs> in a glass. <laughs> this is why we all went to school for so long. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we have to... <laughs> There's spoons if you need like jello no, shots. No, 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 you know, not his own. I am not <laughs> trying that. Get your own oh, own own own. There's been a lot of prep going into this. We, we right. did a lot of like right. Twitter. It's hard to so, handle it. So. Yeah, I, mean, I, I feel like only because the wine that went in that early. Really, I'm a good disposition. <laughs> I mean, it's not being <laughs> here. Good, right. exactly. No, but it's not sure. Right. Are we sipping this or downing it? Let's go. Yeah, do we shoot it or do we? I'm just saying it's not so bad. I mean, it's not texture wise. It's not what's <laughs> wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we cleanse our palate with the barley water first. No, and it's not very strong yeah. cheese. And oh, that's okay. The wine is a nice wine. <laughs> more is still more drinkable than alcoholic horse milk. Yeah, same. We're still keeping on the on the drinkable side of that. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew an appreciation for it. You <laughs> <laughs> work really hard on it. It is sort of like so, down one end of the spectrum. Well, I would like, like a little further. <laughs> than yeah, and the and cheese, the cheese is not like it's, it's not a peach cheese. No, it's, it's, it's like a really strong like. It's not a same cheese. It's like milky, like it's like it's milky without you having a problem. Texture. I mean, texture issues are things. Those are very different from culture to culture. Yeah, the textures are much closer, like modern. And if I'm just thinking. Oh, I'm drinking wine. I don't want it to be chunky. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. but I know. Like it's but wine with dairy products. But I don't expect it. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I don't think it's. Right. I don't think it's but, but if we compare this to roasted meat with salt, we could say like this isn't quite meeting our standards of what something should taste like. And I, I wonder what we could do to this using those ingredients. Mm-hmm. Uh, they may like would would more honey make it taste better to you? Mm-hmm. I think it actually tasted that bad. I actually well, the I, wine that we started with was yeah, really nice, nice wine. wine so yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think the only problem is the texture. Mm-hmm. Personally, like I don't find the, that. And the the taste is not what I'm expecting, but I don't. It's bit, yeah, it's that bit. <laughs> See, I almost, <laughs> we have to I, yeah. I would almost say yeah. I'd almost like a. Um, a str- like not a stronger cheese, but like a, a cheese that has like more saltiness. Okay, good. Cheese. So we have like a salty cheese. cheese. This is the halloumi. Yeah. Halloumi yeah, is right. like a flavorless. Very yeah, cheese. yeah. Fry it. We'll, 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 I'll, I'll do one with the feta. Because I think we could get that saltiness to it. It's like the salt and the the yeah. Maybe it's the a sweet acidic. salty. And then yeah. I'm gonna put a little bit more honey in this. Time. I think to me, I think that that might because that one there's a texture, the texture but there was no taste to the cheese. I think yeah. if you yeah. get the taste, I think the salt would be nice. Yeah, it sort of makes that juxtaposition. Yeah, because the cheese didn't really taste like much. It had a little bit of. <laughs> and then it almost very, kind of did dissolve. I, I don't, yeah. So, what do you think? Would it be worse if it was thicker to the point where it was like clearly thick? Like a smoothie? Or better? <laughs> it's liquid with a few chunks in it. And yeah, I, I'm finding that hard. And I almost, I'm not sure, but I almost wonder if it was thicker, like with more of the barley, say, that kind of thickened it a bit. It would be more like, well, this is clearly not wine, so it's okay yeah. that it's thick. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. like something, I mean, it's because you're branching, but it's supposed to be wine, but it's got this texture. Yeah, it's, it's like wine with stuff that fell in it. It's basically a meal. One. <laughs> it's like a liquid, alcoholic meal. Right. Mm-hmm. And let's it's an ancient Greek meal replacement. Yes. There you go. That makes, it kind they're of older warriors, and they were trying to recover. Is there, is there so it's like, supposed to be extra col- uh, yes. caloric. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah it's fortifying. Yeah. Yes. I mean, again, it's kind well, of Well, okay, like, so who has, you know, um, the medieval, um, what is it? The I'm going to forget the name of it, but ale, like that they would heat up wine yeah. or beer, yeah. and they'd put egg and yeah. other, yeah. and, yeah. and yeah. bread yeah. in it, yeah. right? And again, like that doesn't sound good to us, right. and they heat it so it kind of you know break into almost like a broken custard. Mm-hmm. But that was again the same idea. It was that it was a very fortifying something that you would eat that it was really strong and it was and it's certainly t- still more appealing than the blood milk mix yeah. that the mass oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. to, to us, shall we say? Yes. So <laughs> it's you know, that sort of it's thing like that's maybe the oh, the continuum. Oh, yeah. 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 I have quite a scale. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, does Matt want to go to the next beer? Yeah, last beer. I'm still enjoying this. The meat is delicious. I'm, I'm having a barley milk, barley water cleanser. <laughs> yeah, I might actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's cool. cold water. Yeah. The next spa drink. This yeah. is what. See, gonna be. you're going to become a rich and famous yeah. classicist <laughs> with your new suit. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to my cousin in Calgary who I arrived last uh, on Sunday night with a bag of barley in my lunch and said, yes, thank you, make me dinner, and that's 
that's great, but I need a pot and I need to boil some barley. Yeah, like and some... do you have the honey and mint I ordered? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I Would it be vegan? Because you could definitely market it. That would be very I will say there's, there's other recipes that involve wow. the flavoring not being mint, it, sometimes yeah. oregano. That that's also amazing. seems like it could be doable. Yes. Um, Thank you. Also, cumin, because you know how the Romans love their cumin. Mm. So, uh, like that one's a little different. Yeah. Yeah. It would be a different yeah. flavor. But that's not coming in warming. Like, if you had spiced. Um, what, uh, lassi. Like, if you've ever had a spiced oh, yeah. lassi, yeah, yeah, yeah. not the mango, oh. there's a mango lassi. Oh, okay. There's a spiced one, which oh, is oh, so savory like, and salty oh. and has, like, you know, a spite, like, yeah, hot yeah, spices yeah, in it. So it would yeah. be sort of like that, yeah. I guess. I don't know. Mm-hmm. All right, so this is the honey ale. This is like a mighty pot. Break it. Yeah, this is a bright Yeah, break it. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And it's an aftertaste. The aftertaste on this. Last time we tried it, the aftertaste was bad. Like, it's, 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 like you drink it and drink it and it'll hit you afterwards. It comes back and bites you. The initial nose is great. So yeah. that's a, a little bit of medicine-y, like Robitussin yeah. or red medicine. And it's got a bit, it's fairly bitter. Does it, it's it's like a bit bitter. bitter. This is hot, right? This, this yeah. one's hopped. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's not like tongue curling. Yeah. No. It does finish. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah but I mean, it's a, it's a hops bitter, oh, so yeah. like, you know, yeah. people like bitters. I'm not actually a beer drinker. Um, but so, this is, so I am. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we because we made a bracket a couple of times uh, at home as well, mm-hmm. and that actually I really like. So half honey, half malt, yeah. and normal like a hopped malt. So you've got the hops in it. I feel like this would convert non-beer drinkers to mm-hmm. the possibility no. of this is so. Fun. Oh, this is this. <laughs> this is right? so fun. From the smell, it's much sweeter to the taste. Than mm-hmm. the smell it tastes is. like, but it's not overly flavor. sweet. A little bit. Tastes like like flat coke. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And, but it's like, not completely flat either. It's like, like, but then with that hot oh, yeah, no, kind it's, of. It's, 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 it's exactly the same with the. Well, exactly. It had to age more. Yeah, it had to age more. The time at which you drink it seems to be very important. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is that a lot of ancient beer, I don't know about, but like, you know, Egyptian beer and things like that, was made really fresh. Like, you would brew it, and three days later you'd be drinking it. Uh, so like two or three days is a, and there's still beers in Africa and other places where that's the standard really thing so. and you drink it without drain like without straining it or anything mm-hmm. so you drink it's thick so there's another place where the texture well, is yeah, very different yeah, right. yeah. Egypt, not all so, this but sometimes yeah. so Zosimus actually says you have to strain the beer right and so it's called not so right. you have to strain the beer yeah so so those ones they want it straight yeah, but, they, they but I know there's yeah. versions where it's it's almost like porridge like a yeah. loose porridge yeah, yeah. 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 but you're right like the texture thing <laughs> is so <laughs> it's part of our like industrial production <laughs> yeah. 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 it's just perfect yeah. 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 and consistent and always it's all pasteurized exactly it's all clear and perfect colors and it's like that's not now the tasting kept going after this I just decided to turn off the microphone Kevin prepared a second batch of Kukion with goat feta this time, which we all remarkably tried. Going back for a second says something about how not awful the first batch was. And most of us decided that it was in fact better in the second version because the cheese wasn't as chunky. <laughs> in the end, we decided that the motto of the evening was not as awful as I thought. <laughs> now, the beer stayed in my room for the next couple of days, so I was able to let a few people who missed the first evening try it later. I recorded the reactions of one of these people, Paul, a former undergrad student of mine, who came by to sample the drinks. He said a few words about his conference experience as well, and then we got into the tasting. Well, my name is Paul McGilvery. I'm a PhD candidate at the, at the University of Western Ontario. And uh, I, uh, I did deliver a paper at uh, the 2018 CAC conference here in, uh, in Calgary, Alberta, on uh, narratology on, in Xenophon's Anabasis, in particular focalized barriers in Xenophon's and Abyssus. And it's always, it's always wonderful to come to the CAC, not just to see um, colleagues or uh, fellow students or, uh, or former mentors that you haven't seen sometimes in years, and not just to see all the papers and panels that are uh, st- uh, stimulating and uh, per- sometimes provocative and always educative, uh, but also it's really great just to see the different faculties and different campuses. Yeah, that's right? true. Yeah, it really is. Every time, I mean, some of these cities, and I haven't you know, made the rounds like mm-hmm. some of the professors have, some of these cities I've never been to. Mm-hmm. Hadn't been to Calgary since I was about seven, and I wasn't much of a tourist when I was seven. No. <laughs> you know, um, I, I had no idea 
I mean, I'm sort of embarrassed to say this, but I had no idea how big University of Calgary was. No, I didn't either, actually. I really didn't. This campus is huge. Yeah. I had no no concept. And, of course, I did sneak out just to sort of experience the city a mm-hmm. little bit, which is it was kind of neat driving around. And I, I got to see what I think is one of the better automobile museums in oh, Canada. Really? <laughs> yeah, they have a little heritage. Well, actually, that doesn't here. really totally shock me. I guess that's all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, no, it was, it was just fantastic. Yeah, no matter which CAC you go to, it's it's always uh, it's a really it's an excellent experience. This is the one that started it all. This is Roman beer. Oh wow! Or a Roman beer recipe. So it's just barley and water and sourdough sourdough starter, like an actual sourdough starter from a bread. It's it's got this sour smell. Yeah, to it's it, extremely eh? sour. Oh, it's not what you expect, is it? Not at all. You know what it reminds me of? I, it reminds me of kombucha. Yeah, somebody else said that too. I think that's I think that's a really good comparison. Yeah, really sour and that yeastiness too to it yeah. of a fermented thing. This is like you you drink this and it you um you think of I think of what's it called Posca. This oh the, this, the, um, the vinegar um, wine. I, I mean, thought it was yeah, wine. Right? wine yeah. You taste this and like, hmm, maybe it was uh, yeah, and it's. Doesn't have hops in it or any other flavoring, which right. is the other thing that makes it very because di- hops is a very late addition to beer. Is it not? Yeah, like late medieval wow. period. Well, late. I mean, twelfth or thirteenth century, maybe twelfth century, maybe wow. later. Yeah. Wow. I might be wrong on that, but it's certainly not in early medieval beer. It's um, it's very different, isn't mm-hmm. it? I mean. 2,500 years ago, someone would probably drink uh, Budweiser and be like, how can you sit yeah, down every night? It's horribly bitter and <laughs> yeah. you know, weirdly fizzy, and I don't know about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, and I think if you aren't thinking beer, mm-hmm. it's actually perfectly, like you it may not be what you have a taste for, but it's not like you drink it and think, oh my God, how could anyone ever drink this? No. It's just not what you're thinking of, you know? Yeah. That'd be the, the closest in kombucha. Yeah, I think that's a re- I think that's a really good comparison. Okay, then there's this is sort of a comparison beer um, made with a me- medieval recipe. Um, you can tell they're still fermenting, eh? Because it keeps like every time you open it, it's yeah. fizzy. And it's half or a third honey or half. I think it's half honey and half malt, barley malt, normal barley malt, mm. with and it does have hops in it. Oh, is this what you call a braggot? Yes, it is. It's, okay. it, that's exactly right. And uh, Matt. I don't think they called it that when they brewed it, but that's what it is, yeah. yeah. That smells wonderful, eh? It's almost like blueberry or something. Yeah, it's like fruity, that, right? yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, well, it, it tastes like a braggot mead, eh? Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. It's, it's sweet. To my mm. taste, it's very sweet. I've had braggots that are much less sweet, mm. which I prefer, but, I mean, it's mm. got a good bitterness to it, so it's yeah. not... That's the one that Matt said, oh, it has a horrible aftertaste. And then we tasted it and we said, no, it doesn't. He said, oh, my God, it's gone. Because <laughs> like three weeks ago, it still had a really bad aftertaste, apparently. Okay. But, yeah. So here's a question. Are all these what you would call, I guess, green beers? Are they? Well, they were, but if they've been, I mean, he made them, it must be a month or two ago now. So I guess they're not. I think, and that's the question is, and Matt would have to answer that. Matt Gibbs would have to answer that because I'm not sure from the recipes that he has whether it's clear whether they'd be drunk very soon or you know or just like kept around for a little while right some of the most ancient beers that we have recipes for like egyptian beer seem to have been expected to be drunk within two or three days right. like you'd they'd, they'd ferment for two or three you'd have a grain mixture mm-hmm. you'd ferment it for two days and drink it without straining it or anything mm-hmm. like so anything from that to the aged beers i don't know what the i don't know what we know about it and that would have to answer that because i don't because this is, is this something that if you made, and Matt, Matt gave, I was at, actually, Matt, Matt gave, he yeah, was the yeah. very last presenter in the yeah. very last, but it was a great uh, paper, actually, well, was a uh, whole bunch of evidence about um, different um, uh, uh, penalties or pseudo penalties that they would have against guilds and things. Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay, so yeah, yeah commercial yeah. stuff, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was a big thing. I wonder if this is the kind of thing that if you corked up and, and set aside for a long time, it would just burst the jar. Or oh, something, it would. Right? Yeah. No, that would, that would keep, that would, it's still fermenting even though it was in the fridge. I mean, it would, mm. yeah. If you left that cork a long time, I think, it, but these are the last he has. So mm-hmm. hopefully he'll be able to finish them pretty soon. Okay. Oh, no bad aftertaste to that at yeah. all. It's, it's terrific. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. Okay. This one is also still fermenting, which is interesting. I mean, just oh, this one. Color. So this is a mead, but mm-hmm. it's a mead made according to Columella's recipe, apparently which is half or a third honey, and the rest is 
um, wine, like wine grapes, um, uh, wine must or red red must. grape must. So okay. the red grape juice, really, that's what that means. Wow. Um, so, so what would what would be the like? Uh, is this because honey is much more is much cheaper than or than grapes? No, I think they just like the flavor. Mm. I mean, I in some places. So I the meads that I know the recipes for the medieval meads that I know of are only honey, and they're from northern places where grapes don't grow. Okay. Right? right, so you have the Scandinavian countries, Germany, England, where you don't have a lot of grapes. Yeah, it's good but I, so this interesting to me the the, the the combination of honey and wine is something I don't I don't know this recipe particularly. Yeah. Oh, that's delicious. Yeah. Hey, is that? I think they're thinking of marketing that the, the oh, place that made it. That is just. I mean, that's uh, it's an object of divination. That. Is that what you call mulsum, or is that different? Well, it not. I don't think it is mulsum, though. Again, Matt brought that up, and I think um, there's you know be different proportions, or it might be that you'd add because this one has the honey and it's from and the juice, and you ferment them both. Oh, okay. I don't know if mulsum is made with honey, or if you add honey yeah. to the wine. That's yeah. I'd always assumed it was honeyed wine in right. wine, and you had honey, mm-hmm. but now I don't know. Apparently, this is very strong. Not that it matters. I'm like. Announced, but it's like they, they aren't sure exactly how strong it is, but it's probably close to twenty percent. <laughs> so I wouldn't have guessed that. No, I think like that's a, a it's a dangerous drink if you try. Yeah, because you know, I mean, like I hate to cheapen the experience with, the, but it tastes it tastes like Teddy Grahams or something. <laughs> yeah, it's no, like I know. cracker, yeah. Mm. And the color is pretty. The cool. color is gorgeous. Yeah. Mm. Color mellows meat, apparently. Wow, there's all kinds of. Um, Fantastic things, and uh, I remember reading. I can't remember the scholar's name. But he wrote to the Chemical Muse or something that Alan actually recommended. Oh yeah, talking about calomella, you know, just offhand saying when you're planting your cabbage, throw in a few opium poppy seeds. You know, <laughs> every every farmer, what's better like this? Yeah, you know, put take some opi- some poppy seeds and put them in between your cabbage, just you know, because it's a, a nice little <laughs> cash crop eh? you can have on the on the side. And so every farmer who mm. knows what he's doing. Does, just has a little bit of diversity. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That is, well, I mean, they ate poppies too, of, or poppy seed, of course. But right, it was an interesting book. It was, uh, I think, it was a bacteriologist that one did a PhD in classics, and I can't remember where, and I can't remember his name. I wish I could. Mm-hmm. Anyways, no, the, ke- the Chemical yeah. Muse. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. You can have a palate cleanser of the barley water. Hmm. I'll put that in a separate glass because it. So run me through hard. the production process of this again. I so I don't. I don't know the details. You'd have to ask him, but basically, you know, a straightforward mashed barley or malted barley and sort of barley malt, barley and water. And I don't know the exact details of how they, you know, what the actual process was, but basically you take a sourdough. So, you know, like, like a bread sourdough starter. Mm-hmm. So it's fermented flour and water and you mix it into the malt and water and it, Ferments, so that's why it's got that sourness to it, because because they didn't have commercial yeast, of course. Thank you. So they would use bread, a bread starter, to make the yeast. So was this um, how how young is the process of using um, barm for, for yeasts instead of is that? Oh, uh, uh, what are you? What do you mean by what, it? What I'm thinking of is is the uh, the muck that you'd scrape off the top of a fermenting vat. Oh, okay, maybe that's not, maybe that's what that is. Um, yeah, I, I imagine that was used a lot too. I think that may depend on how continuous your beer making process is, yeah, right? Yeah. So if it, and, and I imagine they probably use that sometimes too. But if you only, if for instance you only make it a couple of times a year, like when if you only make it when you have the grain surplus, for instance, mm-hmm. maybe then you have to use a bread starter because you don't have beer going on. Right. Whereas in the medieval monasteries where they're making beer year round, right. just go from one to the next. Yeah, that's just quite nice, eh? Yeah, that's the barley water. Yeah, yeah, it's very nice. Yeah, it's like. Perfectly pleasant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I must admit, I don't know what it means to malt barley. So you take a grain, any grain, but barley is what we usually do, and you get it wet and you start it up sprouting. So you put it in a warm place for like a day or two days, depends on the grain, depends on the things, and it starts to sprout. And the beginnings of the sprouting turn the starch into sugars oh, okay. so that the plant can grow because that's how the plant is going to grow. It stored the energy of starch in the grain. Now it's converting the starch to sugar. So it goes on in that process. It takes a day or two. It starts, but before you get any actual sort of shoots, and then you stop it. You heat it or toast it or whatever. Stop the malting process. Mm. Uh, so, you know, stop the growing process. And now you've got grains where the 
it, it does. They have low starch, high sugar, mm-hmm. and then you take that and you boil it in water until those sugars and all the other flavors come out into the water. Mm-hmm. Strain it or not, depending on how you're doing it. But the, normally now you would strain that off and you'd have what was le- left, and then you'd add your yeast to that and your hops and whatever, and that's your interesting that's your beer. Yeah. Okay, so can you even make grain alcohol without mar- malting your grain first? Does it have to get the sugar out before you can... Yeah, if you did it without malting it, there wouldn't be enough sugar for the yeast to do it. Like, so if you took that barley water, which mm-hmm. was unmalted barley, boiled on the stove, mm-hmm. and produced it, you can taste, there's no. Sh- there's a bit of sugar, and I added honey to it. Yeah, not Like, much, I added yeah. honey to it, and that's still how sweet it is. Mm-hmm. So there was no sugar to it. I'm not saying you wouldn't be able to get a tiny... Like, if you left that on the counter, it probably would ferment a little bit. Mm-hmm. But there wouldn't be enough sugar for yeast to get very far, so you wouldn't get very much. And the, the amount of alcohol you get is proportional, not directly proportional, but proportional to the amount of sugar you start off with. Right. And then it's about like what strain of yeast you have and how efficiently it trans yeah. you know, and all of that stuff. But uh, so yeah, you couldn't if you don't malt the grain, you're not going to have enough sugar. Is there a bit of mint in there? Yeah, yeah. So it's that water, and then I strained off the barley, add a little bit of honey and fresh mint. Which is so it really just tastes of mint mostly. It's great. Yeah, and apparently I've been told since that it's actually a very common drink in Korea and parts of China and other places that barley water, not with not maybe with mint, but just barley water is a hot barley tea or barley water as a refreshing beverage is very common. Wow. So it's, and I'm not surprised. Tasting it, I'm like, yeah, I can totally see that, and it's yeah. healthy. It's got probably got fiber and stuff in it. Imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. You That's had a taste. Great. So what you didn't taste, of course, was the wine with the cheese and the grain. But some people might suggest you are better off without it. I thought it was interesting, but <laughs> yeah, that would have been a unique gustatory experience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think the only time I've, I've drank something like that would have been on accident. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it's interesting. No, I'm yeah. glad you guys did this. So this is. Yeah. A... And finally, a few more friends dropped by my room. They did taste the beers, but for the recording, I just asked them what they'd been doing at the conference and how they found the experience so far. So, everyone, introduce yourself and tell me what the what your paper was about, or what the best thing you had at the conference, or just tell me what's happening right now. Can I plug my podcast? You <laughs> should plug your podcast. <laughs> my name is Allison, and you may know me as the co-host of Myth Take, which is after all, you did guest yes, I host did, yes. with us. We, That's we right. did do a crossover, we, so we long-time listeners will recognize Allison's voice. <laughs> um, but, oh, what's the question I'm supposed to answer? Oh, I don't know oh. what you're doing. Oh, okay. So this is my first time at this conference, and I am having a really good time. And it has been great to go to a lot of panels about pedagogy and engagement with the public and just see all of the exciting ideas that are happening in classics and... Um, I really enjoyed the Women's Network um, luncheon, just being with a group of other women or, and, and people sub- interested in supporting women in, mm-hmm. in classics. Um, there was like a real um, camaraderie, mm-hmm. yeah. I, I felt, with, with, with that group, which was really cool. So anyway, I'm having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't think this would be my turn. Uh, I'm <laughs> Melanie. Seth Campbell, and what was I? T- I was talking about Civil War and Propertius and how he doesn't like it. Oh, yeah, funny yeah. that. Very bad. But how even when he says it's a funny book, oh and, yeah, yeah, and the standards of Remus. <laughs> why would you call? Why would you mention Remus? Why would you bring up Remus? <laughs> <laughs> Who don't mention Remus? <laughs> Should be the title of your next book. <laughs> don't mention Remus or the war. <laughs> And I've been having a lot of fun seeing people I don't get to see very often and also going to panels, which is, you know, it's good too. But also, you know, number one reason is always going to be, this is where I get to see my friends who I never see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I am Melissa Funky, and I was here talking about the way that classics is marketed to girls uh, in the last 10 years or so. Um, and the reason that I've enjoyed the CAC so much, because it is my first one, is again, meeting Canadian classicists and realizing what a lovely community people are in person, right? They're <laughs> yeah. lovely online, but to actually see them in person, to realize, yes, they are also lovely in, in real life has been excellent. Um, and there have been excellent papers. Melanie's was among them. Um, yeah. Canadians are really doing well for themselves, and I'm very pleased to be part of this. Great. And what about you? 
I, uh, I've already had a one-on-one -on -one with this microphone earlier. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I mentioned what my paper was. Oh, yeah. Which I was on your panel. Mm -hmm. um, you invited me to, I did. to be a part of your panel, which felt like a very big honor. Still does. Um, <laughs> so I was here talking about social media because that's the field that I work in and how we, it's, it just really presenting, showing off what all of my Twitter friends do on Twitter <laughs> and in their podcasts. So people that I work with at Rock and just people I know from online and just sharing examples. And, well, I think that's you know. the best thing because so much with pedagogy in particular, like I just hear what other people are doing and some of it oh that sounds great but I'm not going to do that and some of it you're like no that that one I want yeah, that one yeah. I can imagine mm -hmm. doing or yeah. that one tell me more about that bit and you just need people to tell their stories because mm -hmm. some pieces you can't pick up or it just doesn't work for you or yeah. whatever and, yeah. but you don't know what's going to be useful until you hear somebody else talk about it mm -hmm. yeah. so just the more and that's you know, social media is not pedagogy exactly, but it's the same sort of thing. It's there's lots of pedagogy talk on Twitter. There's oh, there's tons of it. Hashtag yeah. yeah. teach ancient. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, I didn't even mention that. Did I mention I that? No, I didn't. It. Though I did have it in a awesome. column in my picture of my tweet deck. I did have it as a column, but of course people in won't have seen that. One of my bonus slides. So people actually download my 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 bonus slides. Material. I have some bonus material, but some things that I thought were important but didn't have time to talk about. Yeah. And one of them is kind of like a hashtag cloud with like ideas of hashtags. Yeah. So okay. Like, yeah. Think, I think teaching teach ancient might be in there. I did, I did give that list of people that were useful people to follow, and if you follow any of those, you'll see the teach ancient yeah. hashtag pretty mm -hmm. soon. So yeah, yeah. But, yeah, and it's been as we have been talking about, it, it's been great putting faces to usernames yeah. and mm -hmm. just meeting people that we interact with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's a little bit of the flavor, pun intended, <laughs> of a conference with classicists in Canada. I had a lot of fun recording this, and I want to thank everyone involved, not only for being involved and coming along to this last-minute, rather harebrained scheme, but also for agreeing to let me record them and post it online. <laughs> <laughs> you can find contact details for everyone that was interviewed or uh, contributed to the discussion about the beer in the show notes, as well as further reading about the beer by Matt Gibbs. He wrote a piece in the conversation about it and a few other things you might find interesting, including the link to the website that has the material from the conference paper I presented, the first one about uh, social media in the ancient world. I hope you found this episode fun, and we'll be back to more regular programming next episode. And remember, drink responsibly, wear amethyst, because <laughs> it was a belief of the ancient Greeks that it would protect you from the effects of heavy drinking. <laughs> amethyst literally means sort of not drunk, <laughs> uh, the second element is cognate with mead. So particularly when you were drinking that mead, I hope you were wearing your amethyst. I might have been. I'm wearing some right now. There Does that go. count? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we'll be back soon. Bye. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.